This week, I've been studying and contemplating in Proverbs um, chapter 4, all the way to chapter 10. And it's been printed in my heart that every uh, chapter I've been going through has been something about examining a personal life. Um, you know, there's always something inside of us that we wish that we could change. And, and anyway, so as I've been, you know, searching through the scriptures of that, I've just been wanted to share a few things there. Today's verse today would be, <clears throat> it's Lamentations 3.40, and it says, Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. And to focus on let us search out and to examine our ways and turn back to the Lord, that reminds me of pretty much every day when I have to work and I've got to go to the shower and i got to clean myself. And I am... And they're examining my body with all the dirt and grime on me, and I clean myself, and I'm examining everything I'm doing. And as I'm doing that, I get out of the shower, and I realize that I miss my forearms. So <laughs> as I miss my forearms, I realize, you know, I need to return back. So I gotta go back into the shower and retake off this grime that I forgot. So that kind of reminds me of what this verse is like. It's like you have to examine your ways and turn back to the Lord. And, uh... <clears throat> Today, I would like to just talk about this biblical self-examination, its important role in being a disciple of Jesus. We'll look at two very important questions, well, at least one for sure, um, why it is important why it is important to self-examine yourself daily and to return back to the Lord as lamentation is said. Um, for one, sin is blinding and it hides our identity to self-reflect. And two, it, it's commanded from Jesus. And three, it's a foundational principle in the kingdom of heaven. Um, in order for you to really to search out your ways, you have to understand what sin is before you can go any further. We have to understand like what is separating us from our Father and what is separating us that we can't even see sin as it is. Um, many people, when they when they look at this, it, it condemns them because they don't they don't want to know what sin really is. They don't want to know their their natural behavior. They don't want to know really the depths of this. But to me, when I, when I look at this, I self-examine and I say that I'm not a perfect person. I know that I do many faults. Uh, me and my wife especially, she can vouch that there is days where I come very home very angry and I need to calm down and I need to repent and I need to, you know, sometimes I say some foolish things. So I'm far from perfect, so I know that I need to understand that sin is blinding, especially when you're in the heat of the moment. Um, I want to open a couple of verses here, and if you can follow along, great, but if not, I might read a little too fast, but that's, that's okay. <clears throat> My computer wants to work. I guess the first thing we need to ask yourself is really what is sin? <clears throat> if uh Benaya, if I were to ask you what sin, what do you think sin would be to you? The first thing that comes to my mind is the biblical verse that says sin is a transgression of the law. Yeah, right, right. And uh, what about you, Becky? What would you think? Um like disobeying the Ten Commandments. Right, right. And and you are you're both right. Um first John three four says that um Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. And Romans 7, 7 says that, <clears throat> What should we say then? Is the law sinful? Of course not. In fact, I would have become aware of sin if it had not been for the law. I wouldn't have known that, what it means to covet unless the, to covet if the law had not said you must not covet. As a child, I grew up with many laws in the home. Uh, as a child, I grew up with my parents. Uh, we had many boundaries and laws in our home. I was taught not to steal. I was taught uh, not to lie, to hurt each other, to respect my mom and dad, uh, elders. I was also to go to school, which was a law too. Uh, clean up your room, uh, don't leave toys laying around, help out mom, and apologize when I did something wrong. And I know that there's probably many laws that, you know, for instance, Becky, is there any laws that your mom and dad give you? Uh, I'm sure there's, there's a lot. I'm sure you have a list, right? <laughs> so, these laws were in, in place in our lives to help us and protect us, to 
when we grow up older, we all, like for instance, my, you know, this one here, it says, you know, clean up, clean up after yourself. I was 18, 19 years old. I moved out of the home. And, uh, you know, if my mom didn't always be like, clean up after yourself, clean up after yourself, you know, I lived on my own and I'm kind of a neat freak. I like to clean up after myself. I do my own laundry. I know how to cook. I, you know, when my wife is sick, I don't have to rely on her. I can cook for myself. There's a lot of things that my mom taught me for this very reason. And the law was there for a reason. It was to, to help us to grow and to understand. And now the question is, what happens when you disobey the law? So if for me, um, I'd talk back, back, back to my dad and I'd be angry at my dad and I'd say something back to him. Well, I either got grounded or I got spanked. <laughs> so there is uh, precautions. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, anyways, you know where I'm gonna go with that when you come out of the way of being disobedient. There's, there's repercussions. Repercussions, that's the word, thank you. <laughs> repercussions for, for your act of disobedience, especially when it came to my dad. <laughs> he was a hard man, but I'm glad that he taught me what he taught me. So, um, so, but what happens when you break one of these laws and you don't confess what is right? In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of good and evil, but both of them disobeyed God's commandments and ate from the tree. Uh, let's turn to read Genesis 3 to 8. There is something very important here that what sin does. So I'm going to go back to number one. Sin is blinding and it hides our identity to self-reflect. And when you go, you can see this in the very first act when you have disobedience of what Adam, happened to Adam and Eve. So I'm actually going to turn there my Bible and I'll read it. Again, this isn't something to condemn people. This isn't something to, to say, hey, you know, you're a simple person. You can never come back to Christ. You can. This is not what it's about. Being a Christian is to self-reflect and understand that we were born in this nature. We were born with this tendency to rebel. And Christ came to show us in our hearts that we can come back. To show us that you need to self-reflect. And when you can self-reflect on yourself and put Christ first, that you know that you're not a perfect person. And that is what his kingdom is all about. Uh, this isn't something to condemn each other. This isn't something where I'm going to be like, you're condemned, you're such an evil person. Um, I'm in this state of well, mind. Well, the whole point is that you, like, you're sharing this you know, to, to bring hope that there is there still is. always you yeah. know, a time to return. Or... There is. There's always a time to return because Christ is always willing. His heart is always ready to receive. And I'm going to go to Genesis now here, 3.8. And I'm going to read something. And it says this. <clears throat> so we all know the story of the account what happened in Genesis. We all know that they, you know, God told them not to eat from this tree. And uh, Eve did and asked her husband, Adam, to eat also of it. And they both disobe were disobedient. And it says <clears throat> in Genesis 3, 8. I'm having some troubles with this thing here. And they heard the sound of Adonai Elohim going to and fro in the garden in the wind of the day. So the, man and, so the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, hid themselves from the presence of Adonai in the midst of the tree of the garden. Then God, then God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? Now, when we look at this verse, 3.8, the first thing that happened to Adam and Eve when they were disobedient, they hid themselves from God. They didn't want to be in his presence. They didn't want to self. They didn't want to look at themselves and say, hey, we did something wrong. They more as were like, I need to hide myself. I don't want to come to the light. I don't want to be reproved. That is the first thing what sin does. It, it's blinding, and it hides the identity of our self to self-reflect. It hides us that we can't come back to him. And this is where most people lose the way and think that they're not good enough to come to Christ. To come to Christ. In this case, God came to them and asked them the question, where are you? It's not that God didn't know where they are. God knew exactly where they are. The question was, where are you? Where are you sitting now after I told you not to do that? It was the question that was in the heart. Are you self-reflecting and understanding what really happened here? And that's what's happening here. They hid themselves. Isaiah 59, 1 says, Behold, the, Lord, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his here heavy that it cannot hear. These are promises. But then it says, After... But your lawlessness slash iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, from hearing. So we know that, again, when you come into this, this lawfulness of separation, your sins hide his face from you in hearing. I hear a lot of times they're like, you know, God doesn't listen. But here he says that he listens all the time. It's a promise. 
and we can see that the sin, it's hidden. It completely even says, and your sins have hidden his face from you and from hearing. So what was the purpose of this law? Why, why was this law given to us? And I want to jump into that because the law was there to get us out of this thinking that it, it is blinding and it hides. When Christ came, he did something so beautiful that the law could not do. The law was there to help us to read and to, to understand, to grab it and look at it. But the Pharisees and Sadducees would grab this law and they would look upon each other. And what they would do is say, hey, look, at this person's no good. He's not doing it here. Hey, look, at this person's no good. He's not, look, he's not doing this what it's written. And that's what the law wasn't supposed to be, wasn't entitled to do. It wasn't supposed to be doing these things. But Christ showed us a new way what the law was supposed to do. And it says in Galatians 3.24, So the law... So that the law had been our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So what was the purpose of the law? Was it to condemn or was it to self-examine? And here we can see it. So the law had been our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So that's what the purpose of the law was. It was to bring us to Christ. And as we came to Christ, we would self-reflect and we would look upon Christ's face and understand that we were guilty, and Christ would look upon us. And as we knew this, that's how we became children of God, that we knew that we needed a Savior. We needed Christ in our lives. The law brings us to Christ, and we see our sinful state in the face of Christ. We become convicted, and that, that's our very first transformation that begins in the heart. First John, and <clears throat> first John 1 John 1.9, yeah, First John 1 John 1.9, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what the law's purpose was. It was to draw us to Christ, to know that we did something wrong, and as we did something wrong, we know now that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that right there is sin is blinding and hides our identity to self-reflect. And how do we come out of this? We come to the law. The law brings us to Christ, and as it brings us to Christ, we get to see the self-reflection of ourselves, and then we can read John first one nine, and it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No longer are we hiding in our sin. No longer are we blinded to what we're doing. But we are, our identity is back to, back, coming back to us as children as God. Uh, <clears throat> number two, it's commanded from Jesus. Yes, this was a commandment from Jesus to self-reflect. You have to self-examine yourself. In order to come into this kingdom, you must you must know what's inside your heart and I want to touch on here so one one thing he touches on here is about anger and anger with your brother now I, I read this uh, just this morning and I want to touch on this that I thought that it's very important Jesus said Matthew 5 21 all the way to verse 21 all the way to 25 you have heard it was said to those of the old you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder shall be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be, shall be, ju shall be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be a subject to counsel. And whoever says, you fool, shall be subject to fire. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come to present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent while you are with him on the way. Otherwise, your opponent may, may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the assistant, and you will be thrown into the prison. Thrown into prison. <clears throat> here, is a, here is a story where there's, a, there's obviously some kind of conflict with two, two people. And Christ is bringing back to us where he says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering for the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, he wants you to go back to the place that... Before bringing your altar to Christ, he would rather you to reconcile back with your brother. He wants you to go back into your mind. He wants you to go back into and just self-examine yourself. What did I do wrong? Did I do something wrong to my brother? Did I do something wrong to my sister? Should I go make this thing right? And he says, before you come to my altar, he's like, leave your gift here, reconcile with your brother, then come back. And when you come back, he said, then make friends quickly with him, with your opponent, while you're still with him and he's on his way. Now, to me, when I read this, this is commanded by Jesus that these are one of his commandments that you have to do. This is in order to enter in the kingdom of heaven. He wants to refine you as a fire and silver. He wants to pure you as clean as he can. <clears throat> Another one, Matthew 7, 
chapter 7, 1 to verse 5 says, Do not judge, lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what same measure you use, it shall be measured to you. And why do you look at your why do you look at the splinter that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how or how is it that you say to your brother, Let me remove the splinter out of your eye and see a plank in I'm sorry. Or how is it that you say to your brother, let me remove the splinter out of your eye and see a plank is in your own? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you shall see clearly to remove the splinter out of your own brother's eye. Now, here is another, another thing where he's saying that he wants you, you know, you're going to your brother and you see a wrong in him. You're judging him with this measurement of being like, well, I see you doing this, doing this, doing that. And Jesus is like, you know, before you even say this, why don't you look in your own eye? He's like, remove first the plank that's in your eye, then you can help your brother. In a way, he's saying, self-examine yourself in the mirror. Look at what's inside you before you can go to your brother and tell him what's wrong with him. These are commandments of Jesus from coming in here saying it's commanded from Jesus. These are just things that he, that, he, that he wants a Christian to do, you know, to be a follower, a disciple of Christ. So these are, these are things that you have to examine in your heart. Like, are you in the faith? Like, I know it's just something that I've been working with, and I just think it's very important if you're going to be a follower of Christ. Now, number three, I have, it's a foundational principle in the kingdom of heaven. And can someone read, possibly Susie or whoever, go to Luke 17, chapter 17, uh, verse 20 to 21, please. Twenty twenty one. Yes. Okay. Now, when Yeshua was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, "The kingdom of God does not come with signs to be seen, nor will they say, Look here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst.'" So, your translation might be a little different. But. Your, yeah, the verse says, "In the midst." It says, the "Beginning at the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God cometh, he answered and said, The kingdom of God comes with not observation. Neither shall I say, Lo, here or there, for lo, the kingdom of God is within you. Many people don't understand this, that when Christ comes and brings his kingdom, that his kingdom will be matched with your kingdom. Many people don't believe in that. That you have to have your kingdom right with his kingdom. Because he says, the kingdom of God is within you. So... And how can that be? How can you have a kingdom of God within you when you have sin blinding, hiding inside of you? Obviously, Jesus is telling the Pharisees here the observation they're looking for. Look, they're, what they're saying is, you know, they're, what they're looking for is a kingdom of come observation here to the left, obviously, observation to the right. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. He's like, it's within you. It's in your heart. He's like, in order for the kingdom, the kingdom of God to be within you, he's like, your heart has to be changed. And you see this principle throughout all the New Testament. He says, you know, talks about the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's like, first clean the inside of the cup, and the outside, uh, the outside of the cup will clean itself. He uses these principles all the time. And in this case, it is a principle, it's a very foundational principle to me to know the kingdom of heaven is within you. Everything you do is with inside yourself. So there has to be lots of changing in here. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to salvation, there is something that I've read that I thought is extremely important. And a man was saved and was invited to the kingdom of heaven within a matter of 30 seconds. And I thought it was extremely important that I would like to touch on this. Um, would someone want to read this? From uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 43. If not, I can read it. Anybody? Any volunteers? I'll go on to it and you go. Okay, I'll read. I'll read it. It's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been, my, my voice is hard, so it's very, very rough. That's okay. I'll do it. Okay. <clears throat> so I call this the cross. The cross, Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 43. It says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And this is Christ at, at Calvary. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, Calvary, uh, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scuffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, 
coming up offering him sour wine and saying, If you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. There were also inscriptions over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me, when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. If you really know what's happening in this scene, you would understand a few things. Two people were being crucified beside Christ, one to the left and one to the right. The one criminal is telling him, is mocking him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save me. The other criminal says these very words, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you how fast this was that he was saved. The kingdom of heaven was in this man, nailed on the cross beside Jesus. Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our, our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, true that I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man says, for we have received the due reward of our deeds. He acknowledged what he did was wrong. He acknowledged who the Son of God was. He acknowledged exactly every point that he knew that right now, the man, what he just said was wrongfully wrong, and he corrected him, and he rebuked him, and he said that I deserve what I have. But this man, he did nothing wrong. Just those three steps was enough for this man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So many people have given you loopholes. This is how you can enter the kingdom of heaven. This is how you find salvation. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. You must do this, this, all these requirements. But meanwhile, I see at the cross where one man rebuked and the other man scuffed. And the man who rebuked and said, I deserve what I get because I'm not a good person because I have been blinded. I hide myself. My identity is gone. But now I'm beside Christ. And I just heard the man Christ say, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. For they know what not what they do. This man was brought into the kingdom, but the other man was not. And how is it so fastly that in less than 30 seconds this man was saved? And I just truly can believe that the kingdom of heaven was in this man. He understood this principle. Jesus also used another illustration of this, and it's from the temple. It says in Luke 18 and 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus said, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Then Jesus says, But the tax collector, collecting, <coughs> standing up, but the clock's, but the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So in this, in this case, we have two people. One, a righteous person who's like, I'm so glad I'm not like these other people. I do all the religious acts. I do everything that is perfect. And he's exalting himself to a level that he thinks he's better and greater than anyone. But this man who comes to the temple, he just says to him, he wouldn't even put his eyes up to heaven, and he says, Father, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. Jesus says, those very words right there was ready, he was justified, but the other person was not. How is it that all these religious acts, and yet it made him exalt, for the man in his heart knew that he had something wrong, and yet Jesus was just like, that's the man who was saved, not the person who did all these religious acts, not these people who exalt themselves like they are somebody but more they humbled himself and said, I'm a sinner. And as this man here, he must, just by him exalting himself, he was blind and he was hiding who he really was. He was saying, I'm better than everybody. I'm going to exalt myself. He was doing exactly all these principles. He was not doing the command of Jesus. He was hiding everything he had and the kingdom of heaven was not within him. But yet the other man, he had all he had to say was, um, God be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Just those very words was just enough that God, exalted, God looked at him and said, this man's justified. So today, I just want to leave that with you, that that's been burning on my heart for, uh, for this week when I'm on my studies, that, <clears throat> that the kingdom of heaven is within us, and it's all about self-examination. Grab the law, grab the Torah, ask God to refine you, 
as gold and silver to, to prepare your heart for the soon coming of his uh, kingdom. And I just want to thank you everyone for listening to that. Yeah. I just want to like make like a, a quick note. It's just, I, fi I find that a lot, often people use, um, uh, they use the, well, I'm just a sinner as kind of like an excuse to, um, to continue in sin. I mean, um, I just feel like people, they, they throw the ability to be per perfect so far away from them. Like, it's just like, like if they're confronted with their sin, like, well, like we're, we're all sinners, right? Like I'm, I'm just, whatever. It's like, yes, we are. But at the same time, we should always be looking for ways as to like in areas where we should, you know, like repent or just you know, attempt to, to do better and live more righteously. Like, yeah. don't just hide behind the fact, like, you know, that we're sinners. Like, of course yeah. we are. But, like, that, that shouldn't be just, you know, an, uh, escape. like, yeah. Like an escape plan. Yeah, it shouldn't just be yeah. our, our excuse, but it should, like, that should actually, we, like, you have to have, you have to be humble enough to admit that you're a sinner, but also you have to be able to, uh, you have to be willing to work towards perfection, right? That's because true. the whole purpose of this life is that God pre prepares us, prepare, like, prepares our character to be fit for the kingdom, right? That's ultimately the end goal. Yeah. We just want our character to be fit for the kingdom. And I feel like if we're not growing in this lifetime, then how will we ever become fit? It's like, you know, exercising for, you know, the main event, right? Exactly, like, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all God wants you to do is to open your heart to him. That's, that's what he wants you to do. Again, it says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Yeah. And all he wants you to do is just tell him exactly what's in your heart. Well, obviously, obviously like, like, uh, a I, lot of people will overcomplicate it too. Right? Oh, yeah. Like they'll oh, think yeah. you have I, to follow a list of commands to earn your salvation, but that's not really either. Like I feel like the gospel is a lot simpler than what people make it. Yep. But it's also a lot more serious than uh, how many people take it. So I feel like you can go to either end of the spectrum. Like You can exaggerate either way, but you just have to... Commandments are there to is a tutor to, to bring you back to Christ. I, I think people everything every with that with sins. Yeah, because a sin is a sin is a sin. There's nowhere that says there's no scale of this is a bad sin and this is a not so bad sin. Yeah, yeah. There is there's no gray scale. Kind of it's yeah, yeah. It's whether black. You, it is she black. Steals a chocolate bar that I say from the corner store, or I hold it up at gunpoint. We're both thieves. We're yeah. both in that same sinners. situation. But like you, yeah. you, you steal a car or you steal a piece of gum, like it's it's equal. We're yeah. and, and the whole plan of salvation is that you can acknowledge that you did something right and ask for redemption from the Lord. Yeah. 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 Like it's, it's just a, a matter of just admitting that you did wrong and re repenting from it, and I, you're forgiven. Like I, I, it's I, I, don't you don't have to overcomplicate it. I remember I remember when I stole a chocolate bar in a store, and uh, Dad was buying a bunch of things. I stole a chocolate bar from the store, and I put it in my back pocket, and then I went to the van. And and I started eating it, and Dad's like, where'd you get that? And I was like, you bought it. He's like, I did not buy that. And I was just like, yeah, you did. And I swore, I swore up and down that he bought it. He knew out of the, the $360 phone bill that he, I have a uh, food bill he had, he had, there was a, nine kids. That's a lot of, lot of there, I remember half of the van was just bags. They were sitting between all of our legs and our laps. That's how much food we had to buy. And he knew that I stole a chocolate bar. And I was eating it, and he went, turned around, went back in the store. He said, now you go put that back on the shelf. I was like, well, it's already half gone. I don't care. You're going to go do it. And I went there with my head down in shame, and I put it on the counter. And the guy looked at me, and I was like, I stole that. And the dad had to go in there and pay for it. But I'm telling you, the humility of that, it, was, it sucked. It sucked. And, and I kept, I, as a young kid, I kept on stealing, but I realized, like, it was so bad. And then you know, I realized how wrong this really was. I've but, stolen once. You know what I mean? But it just hurts. <laughs> and, and it was from my grandfather was the most, like, my grandparents were perfect in my eyes anyways. But, uh, <laughs> and, and my friend convinced me to steal not one, but two beer when we were 12 years old. One for each of us. We were sleeping yeah. in the tent. So, and my grandparents lived a good ways away, so we hiked down there. And of course, I'm down as a post at 12 years old. I go into my grandfather's closet. He always drank warm beer. And there was a there was no beer other than this full case. So I cranked the full case open and took the full two out. But my grandfather would have known that he hasn't taken two beer. Had he been halfway through the case, I might have gotten away with it. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, so the phone yeah. calls quickly rang, of course. Everybody started looking for their beer, which I held back till, <laughs> till dawn. Yeah, And right. then uh, <laughs> I eventually had a 